welcome you to the 2020 Fall Franciscan Zoom Lectures hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Stephen King, a conventual Franciscan, is a somewhat recent graduate of the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. While at the GTU, he was affiliated to the Franciscan School of Theology. He was awarded a Doctor of Philosophy degree in May 2019 from the GTU with a specialization in Christian spirituality. His dissertation, which was directed by our own brother Bill Short, was entitled Prisms of Perfection, the Vita Icons of St. Francis of Assisi as revelatory and transformative of Franciscan spirituality. This dissertation will serve as the basis for tonight's lecture. Stephen has a Master of Divinity from Washington Theological Union and Master of Arts from the Franciscan Institute at St. Bonaventure University. He has been involved in the education of parochial ministries of his province in the United States. And he also served as a formator and lecturer at the Franciscan International Study Center in Canterbury, England. I welcome Stephen. Okay, thank you, Michelle, and thank you for everybody for coming, uh, joining us this evening, uh, wishing you a happy Feast of the Stigma of St. Francis, which we celebrated today, and uh, thank you for the invitation to, to be with you tonight. So let's, let's, get, let's get right into this. In recent months, we have observed in this country and elsewhere, protesters being drawn to monumental images of famous or infamous, depending on your perspective personages of the past. In some places, monumental images have been removed by local authorities and placed into storage. However, and more relevant to our interests in gathering tonight, in some places we have observed unauthorized attacks against monumental images, whereby these images have been disfigured, toppled, and destroyed. In my own home native city, Baltimore, a monumental image of Christopher Columbus it was situated in an historically Italian neighborhood, was toppled, beheaded, and dragged into the nearby waters of the harbor. Our interest here tonight is not to argue or even to consider the merits of these actions. Rather, what is thought-provoking to an uninterested beholder is how these protesters relate to these images. In a certain sense, these images are approached and treated as if they really were Christopher Columbus or Thomas Jefferson or, or Unipra Sarah. They are dragged away, attacked, destroyed, as if they were the person depicted. Again, the reason for bringing this up is not to argue the merits of the protesters' agendas. Rather, these events are reminders of the power that images still hold <coughs> excuse me, over 21st century persons how in some way we still relate to these images as the persons depicted. In summary, we see ourselves as not only beholders of these images, but as being beheld by them as well. It is not hard to think of less extraordinary examples of this from everyday life. We place photographs of people we know and love, people we have just seen an hour or so ago when our desks at work. We place photographs of deceased loved ones in a prominent, one might say, sacred place in our homes, creating shrines, if you will. Consider this. Have you ever gone through your desk drawer or your Bible or your prayer book and found a holy card of some saint, one that you maybe not, do not even have a devotion to? You're reluctant to throw it away, so you put it back leaving it for whoever has to go through your things after you've gone to your eternal reward. Why? It seems we do this because we hold that there is some relationship between these images and the persons depicted. To throw away that holy card is to dishonor, disrespect, disrespect, do violence to that saint depicted. And we do this without even thinking about it. This seems to be a part of who we are, how we are made. The bottom line is this. Images have presence. They have what 20th century philosopher and critic Walter Benjamin called an aura, which he defined simply as an image that we look at and which looks back at us. 
Tonight we are going to focus on very early images of images of St. Francis of Assisi. As today is the Feast of the Stigmata, remembering the event sometime about this date in 1224, when Francis of Assisi, during a hermitage experience at the mountain retreat called Laverna, had a mystical experience of a crucified man in the form of a seraph angel and came away from that experience with the marks of the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. In that moment, and for the rest of his earthly life and beyond, Francis of Assisi became an image of the crucified Christ, if you will. And it is this image that very quickly became the standard iconographic convention for depicting St. Francis. St. Francis became the stigmatized saint, the marked saint, the wounded saint, and in turn, a beautiful saint. So tonight we will ask the following questions. We will consider briefly the development of a very particular form of Christian artwork, the Vita icon. So what is a Vita icon? How did the Vita icons of St. Francis function in their original context? How did they depict the stigmata? And probably very importantly to our interests, how can these images continue to be transformative of spirituality today. So let's, let's carry on. What is a Vita icon? One of the pre precious gifts passed down to us from the early Franciscan movement is the surprisingly extensive corpus of writings by St. Francis of Assisi and the plethora of hagiographical lives of St. Francis. These texts serve as the primary, primary sources for creating literary portraits of the saint. I am sure many of us, if not most of us, have read at least one of the countless biographies of St. Francis that have been produced over the last 800 years. And it is from these texts that each of us has crafted our own particular image of St. Francis, who Francis is for us. In fact, you can try that. Just imagine in your head right now, who is St. Francis? What does he look like? Perhaps you've even read some of the writings of Francis or some of the early hagiographical lives of the saint. In the English speaking world, we have been blessed for the last 20 years to have access to excellent translations of these early sources. Francis of Assisi, early documents, was a massive enterprise, providing these sources in translation. We should be grateful to the editors and the translators of this monumental work. But these are translations of the early sources. And therein lies a clue to why iconographic sources for the life of the saint would also have been produced contemporaneously to these literary sources. Virtually all of the early sources were written in Latin. The average person of the 13th century Italy had little, if any, level of literacy in Latin. These people came to know about St. Francis not so much by reading, but through preaching and iconographic images, oftentimes simultaneously. A Franciscan preacher could stand before these images and use them as a prop or a preaching guide. When we think of early Franciscan iconography, our first thought might go to the fresco cycle produced in the upper church of the Basilica of St. Francis at the end of the 13th century. This major work continues to serve that function of telling the story of St. Francis in visual images. And today, friars continue to tell the story of St. Francis using these images as a prop or a preaching aid. But before the massive fresco cycle was produced in the even more massive Basilica of St. Francis, there were other images crafted, simpler objects, objects that expressed not only the story of St. Francis, but did so in a form that was simple, one might say, poor. And that is where the images that are of interest to us tonight come in. Beginning shortly after the canonization of St. Francis in 1228 and continuing for most of the rest of the 13th century, a relatively new genre of visual imagery, at least in the West, was created to depict mostly Franciscan saints. These were not massive frescoes, or expensive stained glass windows, 
but rather simple panel paintings, paintings created on relatively small wooden panels. These images contained a large full length icon of the saint in the center of the panel with anywhere from four to 20 small depictions of, of scenes from the life and afterlife of the saint surrounding the central icon. Because these icons contain scenes from the life, from the Vita of the saint, they are called Vita icons. Here in this slide, we are seeing the oldest extant Vita icon of St. Francis, one commissioned for the Church of St. Francis in Pescia, Italy, a small town 112 miles northwest of Assisi, just west and north of Florence. Unique to the extant Vita icon genre, the image is both signed by the craftsperson who painted it, Bonaventure Berlingeri, and dated to 1235, just seven years after the canonization of the saint. On either side of the central icon, there are scenes from the life of the saint. The two upper images are easily identifiable to anyone familiar with the life of St. Francis, the stigmatization of Francis, and the preaching to the birds. We'll look at these in more detail momentarily. Following that are images depicting four miracles that occurred after the death of the saint. So the question then is, why were the St. Francis Vita icons produced? So we have considered what a Vita icon is, but an unanswered question is why were these produced? We've considered one reason why this art form was created, to tell the story of St. Francis, to be what Pope St. Gregory the Great called the book of the illiterate. But there was also another important reason for why these icons were created. You might recall that Francis was buried in the living rock of Mount Sabazio, deep below the altar of the lower church of the Basilica of St. Francis. This unusual burial was done ostensibly as a security measure to prevent the relics of the saint from being stolen and taken to another city. Because of the way Francis was buried, there were no relics of the saint available to be distributed to the ever-growing number of churches dedicated to the new saint and administered by the friars. At that time, each altar in a church needed a relic, but there were no relics from the mortal body of St. Francis. Hence, these Vita icons were produced to serve as a relic substitute. They would have been mounted on or above the altar, serving as a presence of the saint in that worship space. This is very important for our understanding of the function of the Vita icon. These were not just beautifully crafted pictures of the saint in his life, although they are. They were iconographic presences of the saint in these churches, far from the tomb of the Poverello. These images were a way of extending the enduring presence of the saint to the churches of the Franciscan movement. Hence the importance in these images of depicting miracle stories from after the earthly life of Francis. If one could not make the pilgrimage to Assisi, one could also come to the local presence of a saint in their own town, their own church, and seek their miracle there. Today, there are eight Vita icons of Francis still in existence. As we briefly review each of these images, I encourage you to be particularly attentive to the central icon. So now, let me introduce you to my eight friends. Pesha, the Pesha panel, created in 1235, and the only one still in an active worship space. Assisi, created about 1235 for the Basilica of St. Francis. This image served as a more proximate presence of the saint who was buried deep below the lower church. Rome, very similar to Assisi, based on Assisi, created for the papal court about 1255. Pisa, also created about 1255. Note how similar in format it is to the Pesha panel. One for the Bardi family chapel at the Basilica of Santa Croce in Florence, created about 1260. We'll come back to this one. Orte, also created about 1260. Pistoia, created between 1265 to 1275. And finally, Siena, 
created about 1280. With the exception of the Rome icon, all of these images were produced for Franciscan churches. All of these were commissioned, except for the Rome panel, by the friars themselves and crafted by a local craftsperson. Hence, the friars themselves had the ultimate control over what was depicted and the program of the arrangement of the particular narrative images. What is interesting about these images is that each one creates a local version of the saint, as it were. For example, the Orte panel has two stories about heretics being reconciled to the church. At the time of the creation of the Orte panel, the local Franciscan friars were heavily involved in the Inquisition. The Assisi panel has only posthumous miracle stories, most of them occurring at the tomb of the saint, promoting the cult of the saint and the pilgrimage to Assisi itself. With this in introduction to the Vita icon tradition complete, let us now turn to a specific aspect of these images, how they project the stigmata and its meaning into the world of the beholder. Now, if you were attentive to the central icon of Francis in each of the eight Vita icons we reviewed quickly, you perhaps noticed that in each of them, the figure of the saint had marks on both hands and both feet. This is clearly seen here on the Pesha panel. Notice these marks are just that. They are not holes or bleeding wounds, simply marks, as it should be. While the Vita icons should be treated as hagiographical sources for the life and afterlife of Francis, separate from the literary portraits of the saint, it is also true that the literary sources came first and serve as the basis for what is depicted in art. At the time that the Pesha panel was produced in 1235, the primary literary source available as best we know today were the initial works of Thomas of Chilano, The Life of St. Francis, and the abbreviated liturgical text, The Legend for Use in Choir. Here is how Thomas of Chilano describes the stigmata in his Life of St. Francis. His hands and feet seem to be pierced through the middle by nails with the heads of the nails appearing on the inner part of his hands and on the upper part of his feet, and their points protruding on opposite sides. Those marks on the inside of his hands were round, but rather oblong on the outside, and small pieces of flesh were visible like the points of nails, bent over and flattened, extending beyond the flesh around them. On his feet, the marks of nails were stamped in the same way and raised above the surrounding flesh. His right side was marked with an oblong scar as if pierced with a lance, and this often dripped blood, so that his tunic and undergarments were frequently stained with his holy blood. While not slavishly controlled by the literary source, the icon presents simple marks on the hands and the feet. Notice also that there is no depiction of the side scar that sometimes drip blood. In fact, none of the eight Vita icons exhibit the side scar. On either side of the central icon are six narrative scenes from the life of Francis, three on each side. These narrative scenes are read from top left down and then from top right and down. So let us consider these scenes. The first scene is the one we are most interested in, the stigmatization. Here we see Francis kneeling at the top of a barren, mountainous landscape, surrounded by architectural structures. This is a very typical Byzantine style of presentation. In the upper right, a six-winged seraph angel with the face of a man and bearing the same marks as Francis appears out of the heavenly firmament, depicted and symbolized by those dark circles that emanate from the top frame. Francis is kneeling in prayer with his hands extended in wonder. Notice how Francis is looking at the seraph, yet the seraph is looking at the beholder. This effective technique draws the beholder into this most intimate mystical experience. Francis is gazing at the seraph, the seraph is gazing at the beholder, and the beholder is gazing at Francis and the seraph, creating a circle of beholding 
Here the beholder is not just a voyeur, but is beheld by the seraph, a most effective presentation. Remember what we said earlier about the definition of images. You look at them and they look at you. We now turn to the next scene, which is easily identifiable. Francis preaching to the birds. Notice that in this familiar scene that Francis bears the marks of the stigmata. Here, the producer of this icon has not followed the order of the narrative in the literary source. In Thomas of Chilano's life, the preaching to the birds is well before the stigmata. This significant divergence from the literary source should make us curious and attentive. We now move to four stories from the afterlife of St. Francis. The first is a miracle story from the day of the saint's temporary burial at the church of San Giorgio in Assisi. Here, a small girl with a twisted neck is brought to the church and laid beneath the coffin containing the saint's mortal remains. You can see her at the bottom of the bottom of the frame. Notice the woman, probably her mother, praying before the relics. Also notice the two friars ministering at the tomb and witnessing the miracle. The girl is then healed and we can see her lifted onto the shoulder of the woman as they depart the church on the left side of the image. Next, we see another miracle at the tomb of the saint. Notice the group of kneeling crippled men. You can see their four short crutches on the floor before them at the very bottom of the frame. Leading the group is a young person reaching up to a friar who is handing him something. Notice that the friar bears the stigmata on his visible hands. Also notice the nimbus or halo surrounding his head. Clearly, this is St. Francis. But this is a posthumous miracle. Francis is dead. And notice his youthful appearance. This is a depiction of the story of the paralyzed boy from the town of Montenero who drags himself to the tomb of Francis, seeking his miracle. While there, a young friar gives him some pears and urges him to stand and walk. The boy protests, but the young friar hands him another pear and takes him by the hand and the boy now walks. With that, the young friar disappears. So a miracle story. Notice also the prominent presence of a standing man with a stick and a bottle over his shoulder and the instrument for making a noise or a sound in his right hand. This man is a leper who by his appearance seems to have already been healed. The message of this scene is that Francis continues to be present at his tomb performing miracles. Now we encounter the famous story of the healing of Bartholomew of Narni. He was also crippled. Notice the two red crutches he holds. He had a dream that, he, that tells him to go to a certain pool to wash him, his legs there. And while there he feels someone who he does not see pulling his legs, straightening them. It's Francis. Notice again, once again, notice the stigmata, especially you can see it on his feet. Having been healed, Bartholomew leaves the scene with his no longer needed crutches cast jauntily over his right shoulder. This is the only miracle depicted that does not occur at the tomb of the saint. The message here is that Francis is not just a saint of Assisi, but a universal saint who can perform miracles anywhere. Finally, we have a scene of three people possessed by demons being freed. Notice the demons flying from their open mouths. Also notice how they're facing uh, sideways. That's a common Byzantine uh, uh, style for depicting someone who is evil or, or possessed. Here the producer has conflated a number of exorcism stories from the literary sources. Once again, we see friars ministering at the tomb of the saint, witnessing the miracle. So how are we to interpret the program of this icon? What does it mean? And what is the role of the stigmata in this image? Clearly the message is that Francis is a new saint who was so closely conformed to Christ in his life in the world that he was graced with a new miracle, the stigmata. His conformity to Christ was so authentic and complete 
that he performed miracles in this life, preaching to birds, as well as beyond the grave. Hence, Francis continues to be present. But there is more going on here. Before pressing on, though, it is important to make an observation about the stigmata. Given that what we have seen as a stigmatized saint for eight centuries, it's easy to forget that at one point in time, for example, when the Pesha panel was produced, that this was a new spiritual phenomenon. It had only been eight or nine years since this phenomenon had become public knowledge. The medieval beholder must have gazed at this image with shock and wonder. Despite the well-known efforts to hide, of Francis to hide these marks from public view in his life, in his afterlife, these marks become the primary way that we come to know that this saint is Saint Francis, the stigmatized saint. Let us return to a closer reading of this image and what it is trying to communicate. A helpful clue comes from the shifting in the order of the stories of the life of Francis the stigmata before the preaching to the birds. This shift is the key. Having been conformed to Christ in the stigmata, Francis then goes on to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah as Jesus did in his earthly ministry in, ministry, in this restoration of the peaceable kingdom. Like Jesus, St. Francis interacts with creation in ways that defy the laws of nature. Birds, instead of flying away, as they usually do, are attentive and obedient to Francis, listening to his preaching. In this narrative, we see Francis marked as the crucified Christ, then his preaching ministry, then four miracles which show him healing the sick, the lepers, and those possessed by demons. Where have we heard these dynamics in this order before? In the gospel passage that inspired Francis's conversion, Thomas of Celano, in his Life of St. Francis in chapter 22, tells of how Francis heard the gospel proclaimed at the Portiuncula that the disciples of Jesus dispossessed themselves of their possessions and preached the kingdom of God in penance. However, if we take a broader look at, for example, Matthew's version of this story, what do we find? As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts. No bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff. Is it not interesting that this text provides the structure to the image, with the exception that in the first collection of miracle stories of Francis, that he did not raise anyone from the dead. The other miracles from the gospel are presented in the same order. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick. Cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. It is this gospel passage that inspired Francis, his form of life, and the form of life of his companions. When Francis and his companions seek to have this form of life approved by Pope Innocent III, he sends them out to preach. Hence, the form of life of Francis and his companions is conformity to Christ, as expressed in the stigmata and to preach as expressed by the preaching to the birds. By being faithful to that form of life, they will, like Jesus, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Hence, the beholder sees the image and exclaims with Thomas of Celano that he is a saint. The beholder is invited to seek miracles and to embrace the cult of the new saint of Assisi. But perhaps the beholder goes deeper and is inspired to embrace the evangelical form of life of Francis and of his companions that is encoded into the program of the Pesha panel. We now turn to what is arguably the masterpiece of the St. Francis Vita icon tradition, the image that has historically been associated with the Bardi family chapel 
at what was the Franciscan Church of Santa Croce in Florence. This image was produced about the year 1260 at around the same time that St. Bonaventure's official hagiographical life of St. Francis was also produced. As you can see, this is a very large panel painting, about 234 centimeters high and 127 meters, 127 centimeters wide. Therefore, the central icon of Francis is at least life-sized. It is also by a wide margin, the panel that contains the largest number of scenes from the life and the afterlife of St. Francis, trumped only by the significantly later fresco cycle in the upper ch church of the Basilica of St. Francis, which is based upon Bonaventure's official life of the saint. Looking at the, the, Pesha, the uh, Bardi panel now, the vertical arrangement of scenes on the left depicts stories from his conversion, from his early conflict with his mother and father to Christmas at Greccio. The horizontal register at the bottom depicts stories from his life, from his conversion to his death, beginning with the preaching to the birds and ending with his tending to lepers after the stigmata. In the vertical arrangement of scenes on the right, we see stories from the end of his life and his afterlife, beginning with his death and funeral and up to the familiar healing of Bartholomew of Narni. Focusing on the role of stigmata in this image, let us begin by observing a very curious feature of the panel. Notice the arrangement of Francis's feet. Notice how his right foot is pointing to the left and his left foot is pointing straight down. His right foot then is pointing to the story of Christmas at Greccio. And his left foot is pointing to the story of the stigmatization. This curious feature highlights an important aspect of the spirituality of Francis and the movement that he inspired. It's the focus on the incarnation in the birth and in the suffering and death of Jesus. Here in both of these stories, we see Francis having mystical experiences related to these bookends of the story of the incarnation. The depiction of the stigma here is not that much different from the presentation in the Pesha panel. This shows how traditions of iconographic vocabulary, if you will, develop over time. Here, Francis is kneeling near the summit of a barren, mountainous landscape. Notice the similarities in the vegetation and the architectural feature. Also, the image of the seraph, although damaged, bears a close resemblance to the seraph of the Pesha panel. However, there are some novelties here. It's difficult to see, but there are streaks of blood emanating from the marks in the hands which is not mentioned in the official hagiographic sources of Thomas of Chilano and Bonaventure. Francis's stance in the Oran's position with his hands extended out and lifted up is also new and will be taken up by Giotto in his depictions of the stigmata, including the one that is presented as a fresco in the same Bardi chapel of Santa Croce in Florence. Hence, while this depiction of the stigmata has one foot in the established iconographic tradition, it also offers some new developments that will transform the same tradition, creating the standard images that continue to be produced up to our own time. The theme of the stigmata is continued in the Bardi panel in the scene immediately to the right of the Laverna story. This next story helps to plumb the depth of the meaning of the stigmata in the life of Francis and an essential element of his life history that is neglected in almost all of the other Vita icons. Recall the words of St. Francis at the beginning of the Testament, that text that he wrote in the last days of his life, which offers a rare autobiographical insight into his life. He talks about himself. Here is how that important text begins. The Lord gave me, Brother Francis, thus to begin doing penance in this way. For when I was in sin, it seemed too bitter for me to see lepers. And the Lord himself led me among them, and I showed mercy to them, 
And when I left them, what had been, what had seemed bitter to me was also turned into sweetness of soul and body. And afterwards I delayed a little and left the world. Here, Francis described in his own words, his conversion experience, his experience of metanoia in his life among and service to the lepers of Assisi. It is this experience that propels him onto the spiritual odyssey that inspired the Franciscan movement. However, the Testament knew a troubled history. In later sections of the text, Francis offers a rather challenging interpretation of the form of life, especially regarding poverty. After his death, the friars were uncertain if this text was binding on how they lived the rule. In their uncertainty, they turned to Pope Gregory IX to make a ruling, and he proclaims that the Testament was not binding on the friars. This ruling leads to a period where the Testament becomes, in a fashion, a persona non grata. Hence, this story is not depicted in the iconography of the 13th century. And we, even when it appears in the literary sources, it tends to be over-spiritualized, where the emphasis is placed on the story of Francis meaning the leper on the road, rather than his living with real lepers. But in the Barty panel, we see Francis living with and serving real lepers. But notice where this story is placed, not at the beginning of his life, in the left column of scenes that are related to his conversion, but in the horizontal register of stories from the, his life after his conversion. Here we see an interesting use of narrative as Francis appears twice in one scene. Both Francis's clearly bear the stigmata. In the left side of the frame, we see a leper whose skin is marked with the wounds of his disease, sitting on the lap of Francis like a child. But there is a later analog that is even more telling. This image of Francis is reminiscent of Michelangelo's Pietà, where Mary is holding the dead body of her son Jesus. Here we see Francis holding, in a motherly fashion, the body of one who was one of the living dead. Recall how lepers were treated in the Middle Ages, how they were cast out of society and forced to live under very strict laws that kept them separated from other people. To the right of the first Francis, we see a towel hanging on the wall, and then the second Francis, with the same towel at his waist as he cleans the wounds of a leper, as two other lepers wait their turn. Here, Francis is depicted similarly to the way we often see Jesus, washing the feet of the disciples at the Last Supper. Notice the somewhat content look on the faces of these lepers, whose bodies are also marked with the wounds of their disease. Here, the wounded saint tends to the wounds of his brother lepers. Like Jesus, he washes the feet of his friends, an incredibly poignant, moving scene. But why is this story presented after the stigmata? Because of a relatively obscure observation in the life of St. Francis by Thomas of Chilano. He wanted to return to serving lepers and to be held in contempt, just as he used to be. He intended to flee human company and go off to the most remote places, so that letting go of every care and putting aside anxiety about others for the time being, only the wall of the flesh would stand between him and God. Again, this is after the stigmata and before the narrative of the death of Francis. Just as the experience of being with and serving the lepers had been true religious experience, that is an experience of God in the earliest days of his doing penance. So in the last days of his life, he desired to return to that same experience of God among the lepers. Instead of reveling in the amazing wonder and sign of the stigmata, showing the world the heights of his conformity to Christ, rather he desires to hide this gift and to enter more deeply into the experience of God found with the living dead, the lepers. Hence the experience of the stigmata was not so much the summit of his mortal life, but an inspiration to delve even more deeply into the mystery of the incarnation itself to live as Jesus did, to wash the feet of the most marginalized of his world, and to find God present there. The stigmata was not an end, but the beginning of a deeper relationship with God, 
a season of his life that would end with his own embrace of sister death and his coming to eternal life. As an epilogue to this section, let us turn briefly to one scene from the Pistoia panel produced after the Bardi panel between approximately 1265 and 1275. As you can see in this panel, the space in the gabled section on either side of the head of the central icon of Francis is used in a clever way. Under the right gable is the scene of the stigmata that is highly reminiscent of the depictions in the Pescia and Bardi panels. To the left is a scene from the early life of Francis. Here we see Francis kneeling before Pope Innocent III. Francis is presenting a written copy of the primitive form of life to the Pope. And the Pope is accepting that form of life with his left hand and gesturing with a sign of blessing with his right hand, which also was a sign of him sending Francis and his companions back into the world to preach penance. And remember, this is very early. This is in 1209. But notice the tiny architectural feature at the very left of the scene. Notice what is hanging on the wall. It is a towel, almost identical to the one in the scene with the lepers in the Bardi panel that we've just considered. This is no coincidence. The message is clear. It may have been politically untenable to depict Francis living among and serving lepers in a scene from his early life because of the questionable status of this testament. However, the producer of the Pistoia panel includes this most almost subliminal symbol in this image. Just as Francis came away from the stigmata desiring to return to serve the lepers, it was that same service to the lepers that inspired the movement in the first place. Francis leaves, if you will, his dwelling with the lepers to seek approval from the church for this novel form of life. And it is this religious experience among the lepers that would inspire his preaching, his penance and preaching conversion. And it is the faithful living of that form of life that will lead to the scene under the gable on the, on the right, the stigmatization. With this, the story is complete. So what are the Vita icons of St. Francis? Well, they are hagiography. They tell the story of his life. They are propaganda, right? They're, as we have seen, they promoted the cult of the new saint and promoted membership in the spiritual movement founded by Francis and his companions. Finally, they are presences of the saint. They are images that allow us to behold the saint and for the saint to behold us. Remember that these are images that we look at and that look back at us. So how can we understand how these presences of St. Francis can be transformative of spirit, spirituality? First, as what I call prisms of perfection. In these images of the saint with the stigmata, we see Francis of Assisi presented as spiritually and physically conformed to Jesus Christ. This is a theme that would inspire literary production of the Franciscan movement during the first two centuries, culminating in works like the massive Book of Conformity by Bonaventure of Pisa in the 14th century, which was very recently edited by our own brother Bill Short and published by New City Press in three significant volumes. The emphasis in early Franciscan iconography on the stigmata makes this particular image of Francis as in conformity to Christ most prevalent and provocative. When we look at these images of the saint, we can ask ourselves, who are we seeing, Francis or Christ? As it should be, what is a saint after all? Is it not someone who has truly conformed their lives to that of the gospel? In the Eastern churches, there is a remarkable interest in the transfiguration of Christ. In the theology of the East, what the apostles saw was the uncreated light of the glory of God in the dazzling splendor of that mirac miraculous mystical experience. They were seeing the light of God as, tr as it truly is, the light of God shining through Jesus of Nazareth. In an icon, the beautiful dazzling gold backgrounds are not there simply to grab our attention. It is there to remind us that in the saints, that same light of Christ is shining into, into our world through the saint. 
However, that light is refracted, shaped as in a prism through the life and history of that saint. So in the Vita icons of St. Francis, we see that beautiful light of Christ in a Franciscan shape, refracted by the life, history, preaching, and writings of Francis of Assisi. Hence, when we look at St. Francis, when we come into his presence, we are also coming into the presence of Christ, shining through the beautiful light of the saint. In a related way, the Vita icons of the saint are also mirrors. As Walter Benjamin observed, in images we also see ourselves reflected. In the Vita icons of the wounded, beautiful saint, we see our own lives reflected, for better or worse. We see our own conformity to the suffering of Francis, the sufferings of Christ. We see our own response of compassion or not. Hence, these images challenge us to seek the grace we need to shape, to transform our lives into conformity with the beautiful wounded saint of Assisi, which is in turn a particular expression, a manifestation of the uncreated light of Christ shining into our world. So thank you for your lecture, which uncovered the beauty of this vibrant Franciscan tradition. This opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology Development Department. We gratefully are accepting any free will offerings on our website of fst.edu. In the Give Now section, where you can give by credit card, create a recurring donation, or mail in a check. But first, let us please give Stephen a collective applause. <laughs> you can't actually hear it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you. you can see them all. They're doing it. <laughs> yes.